Hello, it's Margaret, Dexter Realty. Hope you're doing great. Um, today, we are on the fourth video with Shauna Morris. She is a professional trained behavioral consultant for 25 years, and our family has been so fortunate to be able to work with her. And today's topic is all about conflict resolution. Now, I'm, I'm sure you can imagine during this COVID-19, we've been told to stay home, for the last four to five weeks, which is, you know, I'm sure it, there are moments that things can get very tense. Um, and especially if you're a family with young kids, like my family, well, uh, they can certainly have their moment of amazingness, but also moment of, well, less than impress, shall we say. So today we're here to learn from Shauna on some of the tips or strategies on how to help our children on uh, supporting their behavior during conflict resolution or during conflicts. So let's just say if things are blowing up in the face, how do you deal with it? All right, take it away, Shauna. <laughs> no small topic, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, and I'm sure it's one that I need to learn a lot and uh, hopefully to be helpful with our audience here too. I hope so too, yes. So um, definitely a challenge to squish 25 years of learning into a few 20 minutes or so. Um, but I'll do my best to give you the kind of the Coles notes of um, helping to modify or transform behaviors. Perfect. Um, support those that we want to see more of. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So, um, yeah, kind of the, the bare bones we've talked about, the basics, the validation, having that connection with your child, filling up their love bucket, knowing their love language, all of those pieces we've discussed previously are going to set the tone. Um, so hopefully you don't have as many of the conflicts arising, but this is reality. So they will mm -hmm. arise <laughs> no matter how prepared we are for them. For sure. Yeah, remembering to let go of those expectations, really remembering about, you know, the, those blessed moments in our relationships, trying to keep those to the forefront, right? Um, the day they were born, the anticipation, you know, what makes you smile about them? What, you know, all these amazing pieces will help us have, hopefully, some perspective throughout our day um, and keep the love highlighted and to the forefront because, yes, as, um, as we've talked about before, with emotions rising, that can trigger us in different ways too. So we really want to be making sure that we are coping at our best. We're set up for success so that when our children do come to us at whatever ages um, with their conflicts and whether they're sharing those or not, it often just looks like challenging behaviors. Mm. And it's a lot of the times up to us to be a bit of a detective to try and figure out what are these behaviors trying to tell me? Where are they coming from? How can I support them? So again, the validation, always having that connection. If, um, if you think about, you know, when your child is really connected with you, they're going to come to you in for everything. <laughs> some of those we things, hope. Yes. Some of those things we hope that they, you know, um, try first on their own and then come to us when we've taught them some skills and other things we want them to come to us first before trying some stuff with friends and social situations which we may not have to deal with as much right now that we are not directly seeing um, other people, but still flare-ups happening within relationships. So what to do? <laughs> We've talked about uh, choices being a big one, especially for young children. Empowers them, gets them gives them the feeling of uh, more control, where, you know, when children are younger, they, and even teens, they don't have a lot of control, especially right now when we are um, being told to stay inside. And... It's um, kind of bigger than us, right? And so trying to um, instill our own values, but also those that are laws and things like that can be very challenging when we're up against just hard no's. So I want to talk a little bit about what you can do so that you're, A, not having to say no as much. Mm. And a way to shift those no's because um, the word no ends up being a conflict. It ends up creating, can create challenges for children and trigger them in different ways. So how it to- It also create negative emotions. Absolutely. Sometimes they don't hear anything but the no. You might be saying, no, not right now, but maybe later. Yeah, but it's a no. Later because you 
head now and they're like, Oof, my top is blown. <laughs> I have to hear that N-O word one more time as a child. It means I have no control again and it's highlighted. So one of the key tips for that is yes and here's when. Amazing tip for family. So mom, can I have ice cream and cookies for breakfast? You want to say no, don't you? <laughs> oh my goodness. That actually happened this morning. Okay. So what you could say is, yes, you can have cookies and ice cream. Here's when. So what you're doing there is honoring. I understand that you really want this. This is big for you. It probably is not so big for me, but it's not about me. <laughs> Keeping that in perspective too. So yes, and here's when means I'm understanding you. I understand this is important to you. And I heard you. I heard you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And here's when I can allow that to happen. And what happened after, what happened afterwards, you should say, why? Why? Yes. And this is where the consistency piece comes into play. Mm. Maybe you remember that one time 12 years ago or two minutes ago or 12 days ago or 12 months ago or however long ago it was that they wore you down. <laughs> could have been one time, it could have been a few. <laughs> they are not paying attention to the number at which that worked on you. They just know, oh, it worked on you that one time. I yep, it, it worked, worked before. Create that moment and get that yes out of you. So this is a way to stop that back and forth argument because you're saying yes, here's when. Mm -hmm. And stick to it. Participating in the back and forth of arguing and the repeating and all of those things. Mm. <laughs> Another thing that I um, tend to do when it is a hard no, so an amazing resource um, for if you do have a child who has um, real challenges, is quite explosive. And I know at times we, all of our children can present themselves as explosive, but these are for the children who are really um, having struggles with any kind of nose, hard nose, safety issues, things like that, or you are finding you're having to redirect them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Ross Green has an amazing book. It's also um, online as well. So if you're not a reader, you can get it on um, a uh, virtual book option. Okay. Dr. Ross Green has written The uh, Explosive Child, and he breaks things down in terms of three, uh, I can't remember if he uses, I think it's three baskets or three options for families. So I, I wish we had, but basically what it is, is when it's a safety issue, it's a no, an absolute no, there is no compromise. Mm -hmm. so what can we put in that basket? And really as parents being mindful about not putting too many things in that basket. Mm -hmm. So, you know, can I run off or across the street without holding your hand at three years old? It's a hard no. No, because I am your person. It's my job to keep you safe. And for now, we will be holding hands doing it. Yeah, for sure. So if it's something else um, that is not a safety issue or a hard no for safety reasons, then it's up to you as the adult to make one of two decisions. Is this something that I can let go of and just say yes and move on? It's not a safety issue. So I know that my child's going to be safe doing it. It's just a matter of that consistency piece. So again, choosing your battles, but being very careful about choosing your battles because mm -hmm. as I explained in the scenario earlier, the ice cream scenario, they're taking notes. <laughs> if you I sure do. Up, I will do it again and I will keep yeah. on it until I can get the after yeah. the one because you proved to me one time that it's achievable. Yes, so, I know. My daughter still remember things that happened when she's like, less than two year old and she's still bring it up but but we 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 used to when i was so and so age we did that and I'm like, uh, <laughs> beware of those amazing memories right <laughs> right but so gosh that, you can have a bit of a dignified exit as well right <laughs> to be able to say yes i did do that one time do you know why i was really sick that day <laughs> make up a kind of a once a once in a while excuse right mm. super sick that day and really i had to say yes because i didn't have the energy but you know what i'm feeling better now and the answer's no <laughs> oh, yes and here's when we can do that okay the 
I like the yes and when. Isn't that well, just think... to make it feel better for us? Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. Less yeah. pushback, right? Yeah. I mean, if you have a child that is like super go getter and they are on you about it, and you are, you know, yes, and here's when we're going to do that. And they're like, but, but, can I, can I, can I? And then I just, to be honest, I just repeat myself until they get annoyed <laughs> and move on. Yes, and here's when we can do that. Yes, absolutely. And here's when we can do that. <laughs> yeah. Generally, in your experience, how many times do you have to say yes and here's when? No more than five. Oh, okay, okay. That's that. There's hope. So, probably three is enough. And you know, okay. usually again, the firm face. <laughs> I like to call it firm but fair, right? It's important for us as parents. Again, this is the structure piece, right? We're adding structure into our children's lives by being consistent. Okay. So as consistent as we can be. I mean, nobody can be 100% of the time, but that should be our goal, to be consistent 100% of the time. So if the rule in your house is no ice cream for breakfast, you're not going to have too many of those arguments because it's consistent across the board. Don't tell my children. <laughs> don't even give them any ideas. <laughs> Just don't start. Don't even plant the seed, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So yes, you've got to have your again the routines that are consistent and structured. Super mm -hmm. helpful for kids. They feel calmed by that, centered, understand what's going to happen next, and they still ask questions about what the day is going to look like and things like that. They're curious beings. So here's the bare bones about children. Their brains are not fully developed until the age of 25 years old. Let's sit with that a minute. <laughs> so we need to really adjust our expectations, right? At tw looking back at when you were 25 and what you could handle in the world, even at that fully developed brain level, there's still so much learning we did after 25 years of age. Oh, absolutely, yes. That's, that oh is, uh, yes, yes, yes. So yes. yes, I mean, I think- but Gosh, 25. Isn't that eye-opening? It's a really good perspective for why, wow. why we can, we can misunderstand our children a lot of the time by expecting more from them. I've told you a million times. Well, it's not a million. <laughs> it might feel like it, but their their brains are still developing. They're still, you know, they're not comfortable. I'm so guilty now <laughs> as a mom. I feel so guilty because well, that's I... part of parenting. I hear. <laughs> uh, for the longest time. Right? This is what these videos are for. Kind of you the longest time my, my son, he's six now, but for the longest time he can't write his name properly. And I'm like, how is it that you cannot write your name? Yeah, I send you to school every day. It's not that hard to write the S the right way. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, at you know, by the time he hits high school, he's gonna get that name down pat, right? I really hope. <laughs> Since it's twenty-five, I need to readjust my whole expectation. Holy goodness! Awesome. That's so great. I mean, that is what we can control, right? Our own expectations and our own behavior. Trying to control theirs. That's why I was like, oh, twenty minutes. <laughs> I'm not gonna fit twenty-five plus years experience and you know, understanding and child development and um, modifying behaviors um, into explaining it to somebody that can pick up. So I think pick up easily, right? And I think that is, um, it left me with a really good point about child development um, and trying to modify children's behaviors. Like I said, we can only control our own. If we are trying to adjust or modify a behavior, um, there's a few things, I mean, there's a lot of things <laughs> that are involved with that. Um, and so what I would recommend is, where to begin here? Um, so let's start with all behavior is communication. So sit with that a minute. Everything that your child does that you, we call behavior, so usually that's in a negative connotation, but it shouldn't be. Behavior is everything, right? It's everything that's coming out of our child. <laughs> is their behavior, how they're acting, how they're reacting to the world, how they're expressing themselves. All of those are behaviors. Some of them are more ideal than others. So in terms of behavior modification, if we want to adjust or change a behavior, we need to find out what the function of that behavior is because they're communicating something to us. 
whether mm. they are able to verbally say, I don't understand that, which is the higher level of articulation and understanding to be able to communicate. But really, our younger children, we see it in meltdowns. Oh, yeah. Yes, things that seem to come out of temper notes. tantrum. Yes. Yeah. And there's always something that happens right before that. No matter how often you think it just came out of nowhere. It never, ever comes out of nowhere. There's always a reason. There's always a trigger of some yeah. kind. It's just us, up to us to be a bit of, to do some detective work, be detectives, and get down to a little bit closer look at what is it possibly that they're trying to achieve in communication, in, in communicating these behaviors. So there's some main forms. Good news. <laughs> we have narrowed down uh, in the science of behavior. Um, that there are some main functions of behavior. Mm -hmm. So the main functions of behavior are to get something, get attention, or get something tangible, a tangible item. So it might be, you know, these could be the situations where in terms of the tangible item, it could be the cookies at high that they can't reach, and we've said no or something along those lines, and they are losing their minds because they're trying to get that item, and their behavior is communicating to us I want to get that item. They might not be able to articulate. I want the cookie. Why won't you give me the cookie? Now I'm mad at you. Now I hate you. All of those pieces of articulation <laughs> later. And it can be a bit hurtful <laughs> if we're not keeping our perspective that we're the adult and that this is just noise and communication. Yeah. So trying to get attention, that's a big one too, and can look so many different ways. So this is where really knowing what your child's love language is going to be helpful. Because if your child's love language is like mine, and it is quality time together, sometimes we can think we're giving our child quality time by sitting next to them watching a TV show or something like that. But if that's not what their version of quality time is, if their quality time is you on the floor playing with them do, with their stuffies or whatever that looks like for them, then we're not actually filling their cup. We're not filling their bucket or meeting their love language that way. Right, right, right. So be an investigator. Look into what, you know, who is my child? There's some really awesome uh, personal profiles out there on Pinterest and on different websites that you can, you know, that will help you kind of navigate to what are my child's interests. You can sit with your child and do them. They would probably love that as well, all that lovely attention. And then you're going to know, you know, really, when I go into a childcare center and um, meeting a client even for the first time, never would I ever go up to a child and direct them. You need to be doing this, this, that, whatever it is. You have not made any kind of connection. I'm a total stranger to them, and there's no buy-in. Mm. That connection is what makes them want to work for us and to please us. Mm. Now, part of that is, you know, as they get older, we don't want them to please us. We want them to have internal, you know, want to please themselves and have great things like that. But when they're young, they do want to please us. They aim to please those that they love. Um, the challenge will be if they are disconnected, they may not want to please us. And then as parents, we're going to have to work extremely hard. Wow. Yeah. Any kind of connection. And that's where you see a lot of butting heads and um, conflict because you haven't done the work to be connected to your child before you're directing them to do something or not do something. Mm. So always having that connection, always checking in with it. Looking at the behaviors. So another piece, um, another function of behavior could be escape. So I can see that a little bit at uh, homework time. <laughs> ah, okay. Where um, I need to go to the bathroom. I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Can I have a drink of water? I need a snack. I really <laughs> need a break. I am so <laughs> tired. Yes. And I was like, you did three math questions. Uh, yes <laughs> but 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 can i just have a break please yes or another one that's extremely hard not to fall into and i recommend you fall into it and then try and come out of it very quickly is i just love you so much oh my goodness can i have a hug oh can i have another hug can we just hug all day yes we can i'd love to do that all day but then you're really escaping your inevitable of what you're supposed to be doing. Do you see my face? This is shocking. <laughs> I've been home here, have I? My, my son does this all the time. And I thought, oh, that is so sweet. Oh, that is the best. 
I love it. And I didn't know he's using this as an escape wow. now. My gosh. Well, disclaimer, your son is very, very loving. And so not 100% of the time is he using it, you know, to escape something. And I don't want to act like it's not genuine. But in those moments, <laughs> probably what's happened is he realizes, oh, my parents really love these words. Like, oh, yeah, I'm loving it. I'm like, give me more. Let's pull them up in a convenient time for me. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty smart. <laughs> But yes, so give them the hugs. Yes, absolutely. One hug and then we're getting back to the mat. You can have as many hugs as you want as soon as we're done school, unlimited hugs. Before school, unlimited hugs. You never limit the love. <laughs> but give a, give a little and then redirect back. This is what our focus is right now. Well, it is because it's so hard now that they're in homeschooling and we're here, they're there and they just feel like, oh, but... But I just want a one hug. Can I just give you a hug? Can I just have a kiss? And, you know, it's, it's like, soon. and then all of a sudden, he, she's, he's gone. It's like, wait a minute. Where did you go? <laughs> well, he's figured it out. <laughs> yeah, I don't he's, know if you redirect him back, though. He sure did. <laughs> So yes, in terms of looking at, you know, first of all, being the detective and figuring out which one of these behaviors do I think is actually the function of my child's inappropriate behavior or negative behavior. Um, and then what happened right before? So sometimes that helps. I know when I go into a, a center or a client, I'm always information gathering first. The more information I have for the more amount of people that are around this child, the clearer or close to clear, um, I'm going to be in terms of just determining what the function of that, of that behavior is. Now that said, we're always guessing. <laughs> this is a science, but we can never tell what a child. We're is working with people. That's yeah, it. What, what's actually going on? We're just trying to get our best guess, closest to what is going to be the best guess. So the first thing I look at is setting events. These are the things that set us up for disaster or success. Sleeping. How much sleep have they had? What are they outside of their routine? Are they within their structured routine? How, how structured of a routine do they need to be settled? Um, are they affected by lighting, by noise, by um, all of those sensory pieces? Smells, um, what's happening in that environment right before this behavior happens? All of those setting events help us know, okay, is this a flare up? Like it's a one-time thing that this child is behaving erratically, you know, one time, okay, maybe it's a setting event, maybe because they were super tired, all the other days at the same time doing the same event, didn't see Okay, up. yeah. So, you know, digging a little bit deeper, then the next step to that is the antecedent. What happened directly before this behavior happened? Hmm. Typically, there's a demand put on from us, a teacher, somebody, um, and then it's translated for them in terms of, is there something I'm good at usually, right? If it's not something they're good at, then they are, you're gonna get some pushback because they're uncomfortable with it. It's not mm -hmm. fitting mm -hmm. with their psyche in terms of pleasing people. Um, what else? Other antecedents could be um, if your child is sensitive to something, a person um, walking into room with perfume and they're maybe sen sen sensitive or something like that. Mm. That antecedent could be setting them off as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, really digging deep on, you know, what, what is the big picture? What is their setting events? Then narrowing it down what happened right before. And you want as much information as possible with that right before piece. What did people say? What what smells, what sounds, what, um, is there an, any environmental changes? Was there a change in person doing the directive? Whatever it is, the more information you have, the better. Chart this all down and, you know, use it over a couple of days or a couple of weeks even. You might start to see some patterns. It could be, you know, at 10.05 every day, this behavior pops up. Okay, so what happens right before 10.05? Maybe they're hungry. Maybe if I feed them at 9.30, Maybe that will make a change and then chart that, see if there's a difference. Hmm. So really with behaviors, you're just trying to investigate and figure out what is it that could be possibly happening here and what can I do also to adjust that? Now, yeah. now if, if we, 
let's just say if there is a real conflict and uh, the child is really upset uh, or in a sibling situation and they're just at each other's throat, well, what do you do? Because like, a lot of time, especially with us now, we're working from home, we're trying to homeschool them. It is really overwhelming. Is there any way that we can help learn to cope a little bit better? Yeah, so I think, um, as we mentioned in some previous videos, having that time together and apart, right? We should each have a long time <laughs> to kind of collect our thoughts. So if you think about what used to be a typical day, um, yeah. We all go about our own business, right? We all go to work, we go to school, we go to our various places, even if it's the same school for some children. Yep, that's all right. Time alone out in the world where we're doing things. Mm -hmm. And then when we come back together, that's part of our connection is sharing our joy when we were out there. Oh, I had the best time with my friends. We did this. Or I can't believe that happened. Oh man, that wasn't fun. <laughs> I mean, most, most of it's positive, I hope. When we come back together, that's part of our connection with our family is being able to not only be uplifted ourselves, have our own time to, to feel great about ourselves and be connected outside of our home, but to bring that back and share that joy with the others um, in our family and our relationships is just going to help solidify our relationships too. Okay. So just to go back a minute in terms of the um, function of, of behaviors. So you want to look at the setting events? Yeah. What happened right before the behavior? Yep want to take careful information about what the actual behavior looks like, sounds like, smells like. There might be some gas in there and that could be a, a clue to what's going on in their body and why they're reacting the way they are. So look at all the senses, um, chart how long it's happening for. Again, you're looking for patterns. Same ah. time with the same person, is this happening with when my two kids come together in the room for the first time that day? You, just looking, kind of digging deeper, looking for those patterns. And then you also want to look at what happened after the behavior. And this is also key. So after the behavior is also always a consequence. Now, typically, just like behavior, we think of it as a negative. Consequences are good things and bad things or negative good things. So that's where it's hugely important because sometimes we are actually contributing and feeding into this behavior without even really knowing it. So, for instance, say you have um, your child is really, really upset and they're, you know, they don't have a lot of language, but they're coming to you and they're, you know, tugging on you, tugging on you, and tugging on you, and you're, you're, you're giving them hugs and, you know, you're just not quite sure what the behavior is and then it starts to escalate and then they're crying and then they're really upset. Next thing you know, they're hitting you and it just seems to be like, I'm trying to give them some comfort here, but... This has escalated beyond, and now I can't give them comfort because they're actually harming me and I need to put them down. Um, what could be happening is that you indirectly, the time before that this happened, maybe you went through all of those steps, you picked them up or the child was crying and you happened to be near the counter and there was cookies on the counter. You gave them a cookie. So this time, this day... Oh, was, no, oh, no, goodness. So yeah. that, that behavior was reinforcement. It was reinforced, yeah. the was reinforced the crying and whatever else happened there, the crying, the hitting, whatever it was. In that child's eyes, I hit, I got the cookie. It's really simple. Yeah. We're the complex ones, right? <laughs> and we, I mean, there's no way we signed up thinking I'm going to feed into this behavior because I want more of it. No way. But inadvertently, sometimes that happens. So that's why it's super important to work all the way through that functional assessment of behaviors to figure out, okay, A, what is the communication here? What's my child trying to get, escape, um, or achieve? But also, what did I, how did I, my response react into that? Did it mm. behavior? Is it going to likely continue? Mm -hmm. Or is it likely going to decrease because I didn't give them what they wanted, but something else? So again, this is very tricky with attention because very hard to be consistent with ignoring. It's not something I highly recommend because of the lack of consistency. So with behaviors, you can imagine for a child, you know, some behaviors are very easily ignorable, um, like nagging or whining. But when you ignore it, what happens typically, you know, for some children, it will just fall off. And no, it escalate. 
But for most children, it just asks, they're gonna up the ante and up yeah. the ante and up the ante. So that nagging could then turn into screaming. And maybe you think, I can handle the screaming. I'm gonna ignore that too. Awesome, good for you. You're stronger than me. <laughs> but then the screaming turns into swearing. Are you gonna be able to ignore that? Maybe at home, probably not in public. If you are able to ignore it, and the swearing turns into hitting you, yeah, maybe you can still ignore that. I wouldn't recommend it, however, because it's important for us to be safe too. But at what level, when your child ups the ante, at some level, you're going to then switch on as a parent and react to connect with that child. And then I got my attention. So it's very delicate with the attention piece. You want to be able to keep things positive. And this is the piece for children over time. Um, with attention, after a while, children don't care whether it's negative or positive attention. They just got it. They just need it and they want it and they're going to get it however they, it's going to get them there. Yeah. And if you I ask, agree. Them, you'd rather me scream at you or not, they're never going to choose the screaming. But when they're in that mode, I'm, it's almost like a starvation, right? I need attention. I need attention. I don't care how I'm going to get it. Even if it's mm -hmm. negative and my parents screaming at me. And then this can become very hard to modify or try to undo. And you can imagine what your household will feel like and your relationships will, um, how they'll be affected um, if your child doesn't aim to get that positive attention from you. They're, they're willing to take. Uh, yeah, no, that's just, just go turn things from bad to worse to horrible, for sure. Because then it's so easy to harm somebody or harm themselves for, for the name of getting attention. And like we talked about before with the emotions, um, you know, when somebody is, has their, their flip, their lid <laughs> has lost control, they like you to join them. <laughs> and as the adults, we need to not join them in that, in that journey, because we need to be the ones that are, again, the safe place, the grounded one, you know, whether you're chanting, I am the adult, I'm the adult, I'm supposed to know better, somebody, somebody help me <laughs> or not. Okay biggest piece about that um, and the piece I wanted to say about um, looking at modifying behaviors is that typically we get it wrong so typically in terms of being proactive versus reactive typically we spend most of our energy 80% of the time reacting to these behaviors. Mm -hmm. that's not where we want to be sitting people <laughs> doesn't feel good for anyone so what we'd like to do is shift that 80% to the proactive. And that's why I'm sharing all of these tools with you. Mm. That's why I really want you to be validating, connecting with your child, filling up their bucket. All of that is the proactive 80% to try and decrease these negative or unfortunate behaviors that will right. 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 And only put 20% of our energy into the reaction of it all. How much better uh -huh. does that feel? Right? Uh -huh. So really trying to, reverse that shift, putting right. so much more proactive energy into connection and loving energy and the 20% when we're exhausted anyways and the behaviors have come out in terms of, okay, how am I going to help you move through this while right. keeping yourself safe too. Right. Wow, I really see how important this piece is. It's, and yes, I think a lot of time because it's easy to react. It's easy. It, it, when you're being proactive, you have to be very conscientious and you have to be much more aware of ourselves and our family dynamics ahead of time. Uh, it, it takes work, it takes discipline, it takes commitment, and it takes energy. So I think that's probably why people put 20% of the time in being proactive or maybe even less to begin with. And then when things happen, everybody just blew up. <laughs> So true. And I think that um, I know when I'm helping support families with the transition to school, that's really where I am having these, a lot of these conversations about being proactive, right? Can you imagine, like, I can send no information about your child to the school um, and they can spend however many years it took me to learn about <laughs> your child and what works for them, or I can share all the tidbits that I've learned about them in the, the time that I've had with them, pass that information on to the teachers. Well, they can set up the classrooms to be proactive for your child. 
Mm. Not all parents want that because a lot of parents, will, you know, don't want safe stigmas. Mind you, you know, I do work with um, children with special needs. So there, you know, there are some families that don't want to, you know, want to have that clean slate for their child to start off with, um, which oh, okay. I can to a degree, but again, it's, you know, then we're reacting. Right. Things flare up. So. Yeah. So overall, the message here really is our children are not pushing our buttons trying to do anything to annoy us, they aim to please. At their wholeheartedness, at the bare bones of their development, they aim to please us. They want to just love us. Um, so if there is something that is they're doing um, that you've shared with them that, you know, it's um, re tried to redirect them away from, tried to talk to them positively about here's what you can do instead of that, and they keep reverting back to it, we need to be super careful there. We need to just make sure that um, that it isn't kind of a, a slippery slope to other things. That we are able to support them with that, and um, and you know if it if if there are challenges that are bigger than you, then absolutely look into getting some support or some some extra help for families. Right, right, right. So I think the last piece I'll leave you with is um, I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the resources. Um, where yes, please. Yeah, where to find some tips and articles and things um, that the people that, you know, as educators go to and behavioral consultants go to, where we've gotten our, some of our training from. Okay. Um, but also really looking at two pieces when, you, when, you're working with, um, when you're working with anger and conflict in children. Two pieces that you want to be super careful of. One is our tone. So if we come in looking to be authoritative, we're already up here, we're already escalated, and they're already escalated. So how are we gonna solve the problem when we're both escalated? So really being mindful of, okay, I'm not the one with the problem, I'm here to help. I'm the adult here. And the other piece of that is so tone of your voice coming in. Um, also, if a child is screaming, I always lower my tone. This is what I hope to achieve for you. <laughs> this is my model, I am modeling what I'd like you to come back down to without having to tell you because that's going to escalate you too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that firm and fair piece, really keeping the tone at a consistent, calm, as calm as you can be tone, <laughs> but also being careful of your wordage. So um, not only the pragmatics, what you're actually saying, but keeping it clear and simple, super, super short. As we talked about before, when our elevator has left the station, when we are starting to get agitated and our emotions are starting to flare up and um, increase, our cognitive abil abilities and our ability to understand other people and listen go way down. I think the, yeah. the last, it's an older study, but um, the last study that I heard was um, that we have about 20% of our abilities left there in terms of understanding and being able to articulate. Now, can you imagine, I don't know if those statistics are like a 25 year old fully developed brain. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> or not, right? So it's kind of hard to know, but it definitely gives you some perspective on. Um, you know. But I mean, even for as an adult, uh, when, when I'm dealing with issues and if I am, let's say, well, if I'm agitated, if I'm annoyed or if I'm scared, I found myself the ability to even think straight just goes way down. Absolutely. We all become, well, I don't know about all of us, but I become Marge Simpson. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just growling. <laughs> and oftentimes I hear a lot of my preschool clients doing the same things. You know, growls or grumbles, and that is the antecedent. That's the first thing that happened before the behavior, right? Oh, I heard a growl. So next time, you know, I heard a growl right before they punched another kid or whatever the behavior was, right? Oh so next time when I hear a growl, I'm going to move in really quickly. <laughs> I know that's the point at which I need to redirect that child or give uh -huh. them another idea or move in or whatever it is to uh -huh. um, try and stop that behavior. So you're right. It definitely, it goes down to almost nothing, right? We're almost not even able to articulate our needs. And then when somebody is so lovely enough to sit with us and try and help us articulate, sometimes they became, become um, the direction of our anger because we are actually frustrated because this isn't working, but you're in front of me. And even though you're trying to help me, you're in front of me. Sorry. Boom. You got the, the reaction of it. So yeah, being careful about all of those pieces. Hmm. Wow. That has, this has been really, really 
incredible. I mean, just mind blowing. For me, I learned a lot. I wrote down a whole page of notes. Um, you mentioned that you have some resource that you just mentioned. Yes, absolutely. So um, again, uh, I'm like a broken record with the EFFT piece. So the emotion focused family therapy is a huge piece for validation. They have a newsletter. They also have um, some videos on there as well. And Do they have a website? Yes. So www. Mm -hmm emotionfocusedfamilytraining.org org yeah it's a it's a wealth of knowledge on that site um, and i really enjoyed the videos on uh, there's one specifically on how to support uh, your loved one's anger that i think it's about an hour long um is a i mean a tool for every parent's back pocket for sure <laughs> okay so another um key person that uh, works on child development and attachment base is Dr. Gordon Neufeld. Oh, yes. You sound familiar? <laughs> he um, has created the Neufeld Institute, and that is a so web page, um, resources. You can also book him for speaking, things like that. But he does have some um, free videos on his site under but they're also on youtube so you can also just go on youtube and google uh dr gordon newfeld um and there will be all sorts the, the two on his site that are called relationship matters there's a couple more actually than just the two and roots of attachment and i think that um, when i talk about connection that's what i'm talking about is attachment it's all about attachment for our kids um, um, and just for people who don't know, I think the the way to spell Neufeld is N E U F E L D. Perfect. Right? Yeah. Okay. So N E U F E L D, Dr. Gordon Neufeld. Good point. Yeah, there could be a different a few different ways to spell that. Yeah. <laughs> and he also puts out a newsletter, which I would recommend um, that you can get monthly, and and it's always like amazing tips on there, different workshops coming up, but lots of articles and tips and things about connecting with their children, staying attached, why it's important to stay attached. I think he actually has about four kids himself. So he, um, I've heard him speak, uh, I can't even tell you how many times, but every time I hear him speak, whether it's the same talk or something similar, it's of new value to me. I always mm. take something um, of value away from it. So I highly recommend that. I mean, who to speak on it than a, a doctor with his PhD who has four children. <laughs> Another amazing um, person, another amazing doctor in, in terms of attachment and connection is Dr. De Deborah McNamara. She also has a, a newsletter and some free articles and resources on her website and the, some educate an education piece too. Okay. So some, those are the kind of the top ones. I mean, there's so many. There is still so many and because there are so many, it can be overwhelming and people just don't look into it. So it's really good that you just narrow it down to three. I like to keep it simple, right? Even three could be overwhelming for some families when they're yeah. going through some challenges. So um, take this information for what you can, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, signing off and going, okay, someday I'm going to look at that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, our children are the best work that we do and we put, we put out in the world. Um, so I truly believe that we need to spend the most amount of energy in perfecting our relationships and creating um, those amazing connections. It's really hard to get um, to, to teach social emotional pieces and connection. And especially when you are, um, you're a close knit family, that attachment is everything. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much, Shauna. This, this is like packed with information, strategy, and just ideas and, and even just things you don't even know what you don't know uh, now resource to look into more so really really thank you thankful that you're you're here with us for the last four videos um if you have any uh, any other suggestions and resources just give me a line and drop me a line and i'll include those in the video itself um but other than that just want to give you a big 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 thank you uh, i i wish i could give you a hug we'll give you a virtual one um, but yeah, no, it's really been wonderful. And so thank you for being here and thank you for your time. Uh, so Pleasure. everybody, if you have, uh, hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoyed this series. And if you have any questions or if you have any 
would like more in some information or resource on any particular matter, just drop me a line. Uh, I can always ask Shauna and get back to you about that. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, COVID-19 is going to be a time we'll always remember. It, but hopefully we can take this time to uh, nourish ourselves and spending the time to strengthen our family relationship uh, with each other, with ourselves, and with our children. So once again, thank you. This is Margaret Dexter Realty, and this is Shauna Moore uh, with uh, Professional Behavioral Consultant. See you next time. Bye.